Hello, everyone, and welcome to our June Peel Endres Working Group All Hands. As a reminder, this is our agenda for today. We'll start with an Endres Working Group update, and then we have two deep dives, one on FBM and one on Filecoin chain snapshots, so get excited. As a reminder, we are one of many amazing teams in the Protocol Labs network where we drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. We think the internet is one of humanity's superpowers and we want to equip it with the primitives and foundation that set us on a great trajectory for this transcendental decade or series of decades that are coming in the, in the uh, next few years. A majority of our work is across um, these many projects. Um, especially IPFS, LibPP, Filecoin, but there's many, many other projects that we that we work on and are, are building over time. And we're part of some awesome open source communities that help make these things a reality. Our mission on the Endres Working Group is to scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Filecoin, and LibPP. Um, we do that in a number of different ways, from onboarding amazing talent, driving break breakthroughs in protocol utility, and scaling network native research development. We are made up of these different Endres Working Groups and they are constantly growing. So if you are excited about the work we're doing here, please reach out. We would love to connect with you. We have a lot of open roles. We work with people across this entire ecosystem. We also collaborate heavily with many PL network teams that also have open roles. So let us know if you see something cool you wanna work on. Our strategy for 2022 has four main components. One, we're focused on increasing the talent funnel of amazing humans contributing to these open source projects, um, sharing our knowledge, uh, building network alignment, building a great developer experience. Um, we have two main, main chunks of, of uh, feature development work we're doing. One, around robust storage retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin, really around data onboarding, data retrieval, data utility and accessibility, um, really making Filecoin and IPFS do, do the core of what it is that they were designed to make happen. Um, and then around driving breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute. A lot of really exciting things that we aim to unlock in the future with compute over state in Filecoin, compute over the data um, that is being stored in Filecoin and a lot uh, from there onwards. Um, and then we do all of this with a first and foremost focus on operating these networks and open source projects that we contribute to really effectively, um, keeping our critical systems running, releasing regularly, working openly and empowering many other teams to get their work done, um, and uh, avoiding or minimizing tech debt uh, and operational overhead wherever possible. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about these upcoming Endres milestones, and I wanted to point people towards a new Filecoin core improvements roadmap. Um, I believe this is going to be getting released on the Filecoin Foundation uh, YouTube channel shortly, but I gave a long talk about this at Phil Austin a couple of weeks ago, um, which really highlights three main tracks of development that have been kind of ongoing for a while. Um, there's the core capacity and data onboarding. So this is storage, making storage work really well and onboarding the capacity to then store useful data in. There's a lot of things that we have done over the last two quarters um, as an Endres working group that contribute to that and as a wider network and ecosystem that we're participating in and some really exciting future work that's happening as well. Um, we've been working really hard to bring a new function around programmability and computation to the Filecoin uh, network. And so there's a lot of work happening here around FVM um, and other, other computation networks. Um, and then an increased focus on data retrievability. So both storage and retrievability to make all of this data useful and accessible. Um, some really exciting work coming with retrieval markets and retrievability oracles and other things that you've heard about. So go and check that out if you're curious about this roadmap and what's coming. Um, we're working on getting this to a new, new format where folks can add to it. So if you are excited about helping out with that, uh, help needed, and um, we'd love to make it a place where everyone can contribute their new milestones too. Um, we also shared some of our high level goals, um, trying to break down some of our OKRs and make them a little bit more uh, concrete. Um, so these are some of the goals we're holding ourselves uh, to. We're gonna refine these a little bit more and then try and finalize them for Q3. And now handing it off to a Dean for IPFS. All right, IPFS, trying to make the web work peer to peer using content addressing. Finding providers on the network continues to take under half a second. Are there KPIs around number of network nodes and number of open PRs are pretty similar. All right, highlights. There's been a bunch going on this month. Uh, Go IPFS 0.13.0 is released. Uh, big features include uh, from our friends in GoLib P2P, uh, hole punching and experimental resource management, uh, as well as some changes around uh, the gateway API. Uh, speaking of Go IPFS, it now has a new name called Kubo. You will be hearing it around. Thank you to everybody who participated in the uh, renaming process. Uh, we have many, many years of docs, so there will be many updates to come on the names. 
there are pending service compliance tests now, which is very exciting. You will hear more about it later. Um, we have Reframe, which is a delegated, uh, which is a request response protocol we're using for things like uh, routing. Uh, it's cool. You can use this with to do delegated routing uh, and combine it with like web sockets to allow a browser to do peer-to-peer -peer requests of data without anything weird around like uh, WebRTC. Specs, there is there is effort to make specs better. Uh, we have a lightweight uh, RFC process and we have HTTP gateway specs open. Uh, check out the IPFS specs repo for more info. Uh, if you've used IPFS check, it now has an additional home, a check.ipfs.network, which will hopefully be easier for people to remember. Uh, and we have new tools like Auspinner, a tool for pinning uh, your data to a pinning service. Uh, upcoming, we have the IPFS thing, which is happening next month. Uh, for folks who are deep in the weeds in the IPFS things or just getting into it, um, if you're building IPFS implementation, we would like to hang out there. There's lots of things to talk about. Uh, office hours are right after this meeting. Uh, if you haven't signed up and you want to go, show, sign up on the website. Uh, and we have some fun experiments underway around augmenting BitSwap to fetch data uh, faster and allowing for WebAssembly, IPLD codecs, and APLs. Over to Alex for JSIP Bus. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, in, since our last meeting, what's happened? Well, we've shipped JSIBFS 0.63. So, this went out with uh, the new version of libp2p, which is all built in TypeScript and is ESM only. Uh, and has these amazing things, these lightweight peer IDs. So historically, we haven't been able to use peer IDs in the browser because they're just uh, the module itself just pulls in too many uh, crypto dependencies. So it's way too heavy. Uh, the new one does not do that. So now we can tell the difference between things like peer IDs and multi adders um, using the types, which is lovely. We don't have to have everything as strings anymore. Read the blog post. It's got lots of details in it uh, and also how to upgrade. Um, what else has happened? So we've shipped uh, a few versions of P2P with some bug fixes. Uh, you want to upgrade that as soon as possible um, and your life will become wonderful and happy and, and everything will be nice and good. Uh, what's happening next? Well, uh, JS P2P 38. Um, so this is similar to uh, the last time I presented this slide. So we can have way better resource management in it. A lot of the resource management stuff has been slipping into now as bug fixes because nothing has been uh, uh, breaking, which is great. It means that you can take advantage of those right now. Uh, we're going to be able to tag peers. So you'll be able to say, hey, this peer is important. Please like, reconnect to it if we restart the node and, and that kind of stuff, which is going to be very, very useful. Um, Yamux. Yamux has been upgraded from Yamux question mark to Yamux exclamation mark, which means it is almost certainly going to be in the next release, which is amazing. And it's been a long time coming. Uh, and that's very exciting. Circuit Relay V2 is still a question mark, um, but that will be coming very soon. Uh, that is it. Uh, and then yes, a little a little graphic. There's a a little nod to to the what what uh, Go IPFS was almost called. Um, but yes, thank you. Awesome. Over to libp2p. Libp2p, the networking stack used by Kuo and by Lotus and many other projects. Last last time we've we've presented um, the repo consolidation. Um, Go libp2p is now almost a mono repo. And um, what this meant uh, is that we now have all the code in one repo, but we also have all the tests in one repo. So all the flaky tests um, were also consolidated into Girly P2P. And we've made a lot of pro progress deflaking our tests. Um, Marco has built some nice visualizations that you can see. Um, we've been chewing through those flaky tests and there are still a few of them remaining, but we've made great progress there. On the highlights, libp2p. We've been focusing on the resource manager across the across the different um, um, language implementations. Um, you can see in the graphics we now have metrics, and you can you can you can see when the resource manager is blocking resource allocations, and um, this can help inform set the right limits. We've also um, added support for uh, canonical log lines to log misbehaving peers. And this can be plugged into tools like fail to ban um, that server operators use to automatically ban the IP addresses of nodes that are um, that are not behaving in ways that we want them to behave. Um, other updates, we've made uh, progress with uh, on the WebRTC effort. Uh, we started a new collaboration with Little Bear Labs, 
uh, they are helping us out on the specification and on the Go and the JavaScript uh, implementation. Um, we've added IP range support to multi addresses. Um, Rust P2P has shipped not one, but two releases um, and uh, is redesigning, um, redesigning a couple of interfaces. Um, there's a new implementation of LibP2P coming up in Swift. This is really exciting. Um, and we've made great progress on the hole punching measurements now that uh, GoIPF uh, 0 0.13 was, uh, was rolled out. Awesome. And I believe we have a video from Rod for IPLD. Hello, a quick IPLD update from me. Uh, main item I have for you is a Go IPLD Prime 0.17.0 release. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the changelog if you use IPLD Prime at all. There's three very minor potentially breaking changes, but unlikely anyone's going to be affected by them. But there's also three months worth of work um, across the whole project. Um, main items are bind node, lots of work on into bind node, hardening it and productionizing it for um, rolling out in you know deployed code like in the data transfer stack. Um, lots of work in the schemas, um, DSL in particular, so you can now um, parse almost all of the schema spec really nicely with IPLE Prime. A couple of other things across the ecosystem. We have um, Adin is working on some IPLD experiments in his GitHub. I encourage you to go and have a look at that if you're interested. There's some pull requests there that you can see the kind of work that he's doing there to support codecs and ADLs and some other interesting things. We have a new page on IPLD.io called the benefits of content addressing. This might be a good resource to give to people you're talking to content addressing about if they're wondering why on earth you would do this thing. Uh, also, feel free to con uh, contribute to that page if you have anything better to say there. And lastly, on the screen, you will see a, uh, a custom build of IPFS with a new version of Go Multibase and uh, a new base encoding called Base256 Emoji contributed by Jeropo. Uh, this would probably be rolling out over time. It's in um, Go Multibase and JS Multiformats already. Um, they just need to bubble up through the stack. Um, it's a fun base encoding. It's a really in inefficient base encoding, but um, you, you can now represent CIDs as emojis. So um, if you want to have a bit of fun, you could have a look at that. Um, is it useful? Probably not. Is it fun? Kind of. And that's it from me. IPDX. Hello. Yeah, developer experience here. So, uh, yeah, last month uh, we completed our first GitHub permissions audit. Uh, we started with Leap B2P Org. Uh, so that was quite a big undertaking, but <laughs> successful in the end. And yeah, we didn't remove everyone. So all the badges are intact, uh, but we are definitely in a, in a better place when it comes to uh, who can do what in, in Leap B2P Org. And next we'll be continuing with IPFS and IPLD Orgs. Uh, we also set up a self-service process for requesting uh, self-hosted GitHub Actions runners. Uh, it's as easy as creating one PR and installing a GitHub app uh, in the in the org right now. So come check it out. Uh, and test ground work is finally taking off. There is a lot of cool stuff happening. I believe uh, lib P2P cross version testing might be out as early as tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. And also lib B2B cross language testing uh, is likely happening next week. And uh, we have a test grant on IKEA's demo uh, from Bloxico scheduled for next week. So yeah, a lot of good stuff uh, in test grant front. Uh, what about next? Uh, so next month we are heading to IPFS Fink as well. So come say hi, uh, so everything developer experience related. Uh, and before that, yeah, definitely drop by our office hours every Monday, 4 p.m. UTC. See you there. Thanks, Peter. Over to Filecoin, Jennifer. Filecoin, we are trying to build a decentralized storage network for all kinds of information. Uh, next slide is about some matrix. So the total network capacity, we have reached 
0.47 XMP bytes, which is like quite amazing. That's how we create power. Uh, with the rollback power, we still have like 16.5 X bytes. Uh, for the data stored in file coin deals, now we are hitting the big 110 PB bytes, which is a lot of data. And that is 10 PB bytes increase from like last month. A lot of them are verified. Um, data thanks to the evergreen and data programs that we will get more details later. There's a lot of useful variable data sets being stored with all these like verified deal, including OpenC with NFTs, Internet Archive, all these things on the, on the corner there. Uh, the daily data growth rate is now 0.7667 six, petabytes per day. Um, that is like over 100 terabytes every day, uh, even just with like verified deals, uh, including a lot of like evergreen renewal de deals from like state shop. So just like keeping data persistent of our coin network is a huge effort here. And it's going well. Now our file queen highlights the thing we have be all been waiting for. The FBN Big MY is gonna be shipping very soon. We finally has a date, it's July the 6th. Please mark that on your calendar. Uh, we have been testing a lot thanks to Zan, the forest team. Now we have 100% full test coverage on the beauty actor, the actor in, really in rust, and um, that's ready to be switched uh, from the ghost back actor upon the upgrade. We have done a lot of butterfly testing for like over two months, honestly, and then have a very long list of the checkbox we has checked off uh, from like Lotus team and the community. We have also upgraded the, the calibration testnet, which is the mean that like testnet we have uh, on June the 16th, like last Wednesday. And we started to work with like ecosystem, like stakeholders, like exchanges partners uh, to upgrade and their node and make sure they work really well with FEM and be ready for the upgrade and a lot of like a community testing still ongoing with like storage providers and clients. Uh, we can never stop there. So we are already scoping our work V17. The, uh, the same will be around addressing a lot of FIPS that's like in the backlogs, uh, but mainly also working towards like enable storage and road market programmability so that once if MM2 is here, a lot of use cases can be built, uh, can be built there. FEM team also has been like, you know, non-stop moving towards M2 already. Uh, so M2 is going to be the one that enable user program um, ability. We have answered a lot of questions in the AMA on this Wednesday. I link, uh, we have a link there. You can go follow up. We are also going to have a blog post to uh, to summarize everything by the Falcon Foundation. A lot of early builders are building test nets, SDKs, tooling, smart contracts, follow the FEM channel for the latest updates. FVM, EVM repository, like this semi-secret project, now it's public. Uh, Rao is going to give a very deep dive uh, later on as well, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, the crypto team has been working on Halo 2. All the circuit work is already completed. We are moving on like API integrations and to enable and then to an usability and correctness testing, and hopefully we can have it in Falcon Network uh, very soon. Upcoming opportunities, again, we have V16 upgrade. Uh, we are we have done a lot of testing. We are all feeling very good about this upcoming upgrade. However, this is the biggest upgrade since midnight left off. So we would love to have everyone in the PLN, in the Falcon network, just to stay very responsive and reactive uh, around the upgrade epoch this time, just so that we can, you know, I'll be ready for anything that may occur. Uh, we also, for Falcon, we also have booths. Uh, we will have a detailed update later, but this is the go-to market software that the Bayrock teams has been building. They just have published their first stable release that enable lightning faster storage deal making experience. So please go check it out. And again, a lot of FEM, EVM, MT opportunities that we're looking forward to. We will be, we will at Phil Austin, we will be at Field Toronto again with a lot of fun workshops, uh, including watching a Solidity contract to, to be deployed on FEM, like in real life, and also a minor uh, updated minor workshop from Magic. So come to say hi if you are around. I think that's it. Woohoo, more than enough. Really exciting things happening. Over to our team updates. Jesse first with all of the NetOps work. 
I think first, uh, we still keep checking our TDFB uh, first title, uh, the first title first bit, uh, still around like 11 seconds. Uh, in the next slide, you will hear about what we are going to improve it to make it better, to reduce the uh, TTFB uh, 90, 95 part, uh, the, 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 the mean time. I think that will be a future of a huge improve after we implement some of the uh, improvement in our network. Um, the IPFS class, the PM update upload, uh, still keep growing, uh, which is uh, pretty healthy. Now is we have around 905, 900, 95 million pins uh, totally. I think that's a great number for us. Um, for the uh, IPFS IO gateway request, uh, it's around 800 million. Uh, still keep very sta stately uh, with whatever we have. Um, we're hoping this number will slowly getting lower because we want to have more people running gateway with us together instead of like we are the only one uh, or we are the few ones running it. Uh, it's the same to the unit uh, user uh, in our IPFS uh, gateway. Uh, we still keep growing stately. Uh, we also hoping we can get more support from the community when other uh, people also helping us to run the gateway in the future. Uh, our uh, network uptime, um, DRAM, uh, API, Chime.lab, uh, Sentinel, uh, File Info for no IPFS gateway always uh, close to uh, 100%. The IPFS gateway is uh, a night. 99.98%, uh, IPFS boost threaten is 100%. I think all the key number we're still checking it is still pretty positive. Um, we're hoping we can improve the uh, TTFB version and we're also hoping we can reduce our IPFS gateway number version. That's what people will come in to help us. Uh, thank you. All right, so um, this is uh, production engineering. It's a new team that we've set up in NetOps. And our kind of remit is to look at the non-functional parts of our software. So things like uh, performance and reliability um, and uh, security and operability and all, all those good things that aren't uh, to do with actual features. Um, so our current project is to look at the time to first byte in the gateway and improve that. So we're building new infrastructure to let us do A-B testing so we can deploy new versions of the gateway side by side with existing versions, do comparisons with those. Um, and first target is to look at uh, garbage collection in I IPFS, Go IPFS, because the current default behavior is uh, to throw everything away that isn't pinned. Uh, and for a gateway, well, we wanted to act more like a smart cache where we actually keep things that are useful uh, in, the, in the block store for longer. So to do that, we're doing things like measuring uh, how blocks are fetched, how, how long they take to fetch from the network, or how frequently they're accessed uh, from the block store. And we're going to use that to build a metric that lets us uh, selectively delete things that are that are easy to re easy to recreate, and to keep things that are hard to fetch and uh, used quite often. Uh, we've got a Notion page with a whole bunch of stuff around what we're working on at the moment, um, and there are a whole bunch of new opportunities in this area. This is just one thing to time first byte. Uh, the, the number of things that affect that, I mean, just literally huge. But things like uh, being able to cache better or be able to optimize uh, production of certain types of uh, directory listings, um, or even just looking into how BitSwap is used and tuned within uh, the gateway itself. So, uh, I mean, there's more than just uh, what I've listed here. So go and have a look at Notion and see how, uh, if you've got anything that you want to suggest and add to that, then feel free to do that as well. Awesome. Great stuff. Giannis, tell us about ProBlab. Hello, hello. Um... So some of you have heard about problem here or there. Uh, just a quick intro that uh, it's a new effort that is working uh, pretty closely with production engineering, lib P2P and IPFS stewards, um, and with a mission to do scientific like methodologies on measurements um, for you know measurement benchmarking and optimization of the IPFS protocol stack. Uh, so the main mission, the, the main motto, if I should say, is that you can't improve what you don't measure. Uh, so that's that's the purpose here. And by measuring, we then go on and build, uh, try to build optimizations with the other teams. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've got several um, several updates. We've got several ongoing projects, which uh, you see in the bullet point list there. 
um, the digital working table health. Um, we're working with the Lipid-B team to measure the success rate of nut hole punching, uh, the new big thing on Lipid-B, bit swap that um, uh, Ian also just mentioned. We've been to several events um, in April in the PP Festival in Paris. We're organizing our own workshop, uh, DIMPS or DIMPS, in, um, in a few days in Bologna. And then we're going to be at uh, ACM Sitcom, where we actually also have published a, a paper on the design and evaluation of IPFS. A great read with um, a very detailed uh, description of how things work at the protocol level. Um, the team is small, the PL team is small, uh, with uh, Guillaume that joined a couple of months ago and Dennis a great external collaborator that accepted our offer. But we should I should also mention that we have a great thriving community of outside um, collaborators that um, help make all this happen. Uh, several opportunities, I would uh, definitely point you to a blog post that is on the IPFS blog. I'm going to link it in the chat. Uh, we've got a Notion page where uh, that you can find there where you can come and contribute, come to your office hours. There's a GitHub repository where if you want to um, you know, uh, suggest an idea for measurement uh, in some part of the protocol stack, uh, feel free to go and suggest it there. That's me. Thank you. Awesome. Michael, tell us what's new with Nitro. Hey, -o. Uh, yeah, we still have tons of uploads coming in uh, and our growth is still looking really good. Um, some roadmap updates uh, in the next few weeks, actually, we'll be swapping Elastic IPFS and Go IPFS cluster um, as our primary and secondary store. Um, so IP, Elastic IPFS will become the primary store and what we wait on for the availability guarantee. Um, in early Q3, uh, we'll be shipping the standalone service and library for our new upload interface, which is built entirely on that Elastic provider interface. Um, so that's really exciting. We have a demo of that coming on Monday. Uh, Web3 Storage Gateway is also coming out the next like month. Uh, same with W3 Name Standalone Service, which is a public, um, I think the initial version free IPNS service for people to use. Uh, later in Q3, we're, we're looking at um, a new console for the new services and everything around the new upload interface. And rather than last time where we built, you know, NFT storage and web3 storage in separate sprints with different code bases we're looking at consolidating the whole code base and having a set of reusable widgets that anybody can just kind of plug in for any of the stuff that we built as well um yeah and uh we also had some great libraries ship uh ucanto for our uh ucan based rpc uh car v2 index implementation in js called cardex uh, from alan and we've also got a new logo for dag house uh for kind of post nucleation branding and that's it who head rock jacob Yes, so quick highlights. Boost 1.0 shipped last week. Blog post shipped today, so you can check it out, take a read. Um, we're excited to work on adoption there and currently working with uh, Sentinel to try to get more metrics around there to analyze the deal ingestion uh, of, through Boost versus uh, Lotus Markets. Um, also, not on here because it's hot off the press. Picnic shipped the their indexer this week. It's now in production. And so we'll be working with them uh, to make sure that those are synced. Super exciting to see storage providers running large scale indexers. Um, and then in terms of roadmap for Bedrock, a lot of what we're looking at for the second half of the year is to really consolidate the work that we're doing and focus really hard on our top line goals. And so what we're going to be working on, uh, data onboarding, making sure that we're doing everything we can to scale up boost uh, in markets to get to this five petabytes per day goal in Q3. Uh, we're also going to be working on consolidating our data transfer work streams and boost into focusing heavily on scalability and reliability of retrieval. I uh, really want to get to this P99 of data on the network has a 99% success rate with retrieval. A lot of work we're doing there right now is scaling up the auto retrieve project, um, getting a lot more data there. And so look forward to, to posting more metrics there on, on analysis of retrieval. And then also we'll continue to work with between indexer and retrieval on interoperability of IPFS Filecoin, as well as performance of uh, IPFS to IPFS retrieval on the network. Awesome, great work. Congrats on the launch. Over to Patrick for retrieval markets. Hey, um, so yeah, retrieval markets. In the working group, we've got 10 grants in progress at the moment and 14 teams uh, in the group and four more interested in, in contributing. Uh, totaling 50 plus active contributors. Um, the retrieval markets team is looking to get a network deployed of retrieval providers or multiple networks. One such network is Saturn, 
which is being built by the Saturn team uh, as part of Ventures. Um, Saturn has launched in a private mainnet, which has now got 29 nodes around the world and has served 15 million retrievals, uh, albeit ones that we've set up ourselves rather than from external places, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, highlights, we've got two new hires into the team and one close to the finish line. Uh, there is a retrieval market roll-up of the first half of the year, which just goes through all the things we've been looking at, the different topics. Uh, we've shipped a new retrieval.market website. Uh, we've shipped a Web3 CDN performance comparison dashboard. Um, and then for Saturn, we've shipped a few things around the main net, a performance dashboard, uh, an information website, and then also a website which shows node operators how much they earn in a dashboard. Thanks very much. Ooh, dashboards. I am excited about this. I will send out the deck so we can all look at the slides later. Um, I believe David flagged that he and Wes were out, um, but lots of, of excitement here on the Compute Over Data stream as well. Um, Bacalao has now public notes as well, probably in early testing, um, have four releases, two new team members, um, and I believe they're also um, starting up a, a broader group around compute over data, similar to the retrieval market working group. So some exciting stuff on the roadmap and some exciting opportunities going forward. Um, feel free to, to read the slide if you have more questions. Now we're going to jump into our spotlights um, of awesome new things to highlight. First and foremost, Boost GA release. Brenda, tell us more. Hello, everyone. Um, really excited to share more about Boost. Um, I know we've been talking about it for a while, but really briefly for those who forgot what it was or haven't heard of it before, um, it's a tool um, for storage providers to easily manage data onboarding and retrieval on the point network. And you can do things like, you know, have greater visibility into your um, deal-making pipeline with a new web UI. Um, you have a really lightweight client for proposing deals, so you don't have to run your full Lotus node. Um, you can also make storage deals with HTTP, HTTP data transfer and more. So um, yeah, there's lots more in the docs that you can go and click in there. Um, so super excited to um, yeah share that we can actually, uh, or that we have launched Boost as of last Wednesday. So for those of you who don't know, please go read about it. Um, in earlier in the Bedrock update, you'll have a link to the blog post um that you can read as well so that's super exciting um just sharing really quickly for what's next we want to push adoption of boost across storage providers especially those that are onboarding data but um eventually we do want to have a path to sunset and duplicate leg legacy markets so um yeah next we're going to basically push adoption um for storage providers share more broadly across the ecosystem that we're moving all the markets capabilities to boost and we also want to have measurable ways to um, see how this is basically helping the data onboarding rate. Um, also, we want to build and design for scaling boost. If you know storage providers that have input um, on this, please point them to that link there in the slide. Um, we have a discussion going on in GitHub there. Um, and I think it's one of the biggest, like, I guess, pieces of feedback from the storage provider ecosystem. So if you, if you know, please point them there to provide input. And also we want to develop and launch retrieval capabilities next. So yeah, thanks everyone for the hard work. Um, shout out to Dirk, Anton, Arsh, who also worked on this, um, Jake, obviously, and Mayank, who actually is like dedicated Bedrock TSC now, and he's been helping us a ton with support, troubleshooting, issues, triage, and improving docs. So that's been super helpful. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. And uh stay updated for more um boost releases in the future awesome thank you brenda jennifer for lotus ht roadmap lotus uh we are what's lotus in case anyone doesn't know it's the reference implementation for the falcon network the team our team's mission and goal is basically keep falcon network running and keep improving it so that the falcon network can be useful we also want to enable storage providers to provide uh, a lot of like uh, storage services for the network for all those amazing data and we also want to enable developers to build their own business and applications tooling and everything on top of falcon or like on lotus so that uh, users can actually use uh, falcon for fun stuff uh, so to do all those things, we have a lot of things to do. So we have done our H2 planning, which is now public. I have a link there. If you want to see all the details, click on that. Uh, 
we can talk about like key three priorities like for now because things like keep changing. Uh, first, we have to keep uh, continue like working with our friends at FEM team to make sure that M1 goes uh, really well, maintenance, uh, maintain that and make sure that if anything needs support for M2, we're going to be there. We're also going to develop like network V17, which will be mainly work with crypto net lab um, pro uh, protocol opportunity team to enable low and storage market programmability, um, just like uh, for a part of FEM M2. We are also going to be working on Split Store, which is uh, built on uh, Vsauce work. Uh, that's to help with chain management, and we want to ship that in like production for our users. Uh, we're going to look at signature domain separation so that for user contract, we can handle all those uh, securely in the network. We also want to improve our ceiling pipeline so that it can scale uh, scale enough to work with like booths and also maybe build city as a service uh, for the storage providers we want to ship our v1 api has a lot of improvement on our gateway apis also support some like you know fem m2 maybe evm just rpc apis with it so that developers can deploy their smart contracts and improve uh, integrate with that. Uh, we also want to ship a like kind. However, currently we don't really know how we want to do that yet. So if you know anyone has like previous experience on implementing a like kind for blockchain, please let us know. We would love to chat with them. Uh, we are also going to do a series of like short tutorials and workshops so that like Lotus become easier for people to use because like it's a very complicated system and software. Uh, a lot of things to do, but we are a relatively small team. So we are hiring a lot. So if you know any good EMs, software engineers, or technical support engineers, please send them our way. Uh, and that's it. Oh, and also one more thing. Uh, we are still planning for our Q4 power test. So if you have anything that might need to like Lotus attention, please reach out to me, Jenny Juju of Falcon Slack. Super great. Follow along closely. Over to Vic for the latest FIP from Crypto Ethan Lab. Hi everyone. Um, Juan, Molly, and Crypto Econ Lab have posted a FIP discussion uh, to introduce a sector duration multiplier for longer term sector commitment. Um, the kind of idea is that since longer term deals and storage commitments to the network are more in line with the network's goal to store humanity's most useful data, and because SPs take on increased liquidity and operational risks in storing deals slash committing capacity for longer, uh, we want to reward that with a multiplier on their, you know, on their QAP. So, you know, similar to how Phil Plus introduces a verified deals multiplier, which rewards SPs for storing useful data, um, this FIP introduces a duration multiplier to reward SPs for committing their resources to the network for longer. Um, I've linked the discussion in, in the PowerPoint, so please feel free to provide your thoughts, provide input, suggestions, or questions. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're continually iterating on this, on, on this FIP, and, and we want to get this out there soon. Woohoo! Everyone take a look and add your thoughts and questions. Um, thanks to the folks who already did. Over to Russell for the pinning service compliance checker. Thanks, Molly. So everyone, just first up, this is very noisy and I know that, but these GIFs all loop multiple times. So you can watch those as I continue talking about all of the items. So uh, pinning service compliance checker, what is it? Uh, there are multiple pinning service providers and uh, we wanna make sure that they're all providing the same sort of support to our users. Uh, you can read a lot more in the launch announcement about the history and how it came about, but um, why did we need this? Uh, the spec was the only thing for services to base their implementations on. No client existed, there is now, you can check that out, um, which can exacerbate feature disparis disparity, which you can see in the different reports and where some services are failing compliance and passing. Um, so now we can try and align them better. A uh, huge shout out to Lawrence and Daniel. My time is up. Awesome. Well, everyone can look at the gifts and see the amazing work that, that has been happening here. Um, some great quotes as well. And over to Ecosystem. Mosh, tell us about all of the cool stuff that's been happening in Ecosystem Working Group. 
Hi, I'm Mosh uh, from the Ecosystem Working Group. Our mission is to see the long-term growth of the decentralized web. Um, we're cultivating a wide variety of stakeholders, aligning them with the success of IPFS, Filecoin, and the P2P, and treating them like gold. Okay, so what does that mean? In the past couple of weeks, our team's been really, um, really active. Uh, the big event this week is NFT NYC. Um, we're doing events, uh, running community uh, meetups, um, and doing a lot of business development. So how... Do, how does going to parties translate into 68 million NFT stored? Um, well, uh, a lot of the relationship building, all, a lot of the founders and relationship building and, and even the technical decision making is happening in these really, really informal forums. So unlike any other vertical where you can do business development on email and Zoom calls, this is all happening in chats and events and 9 a.m. dance parties. Um, and so that's where we build some great relationships, um, you know, then follow up afterward, uh, debug any technical integration questions or you know, scaling questions or, or issues you know, with retrieval performance or anything like that, really go um, use through our 360 tools to help them succeed. Um, and our focus on this pipeline has yielded, I think, uh, seven, uh, major partners, that's co um, companies or projects with seven to 10 um, figure market caps. Um, and, you know, all of those become multipliers that then enable lots of other builders and creators to use those platforms to, to create um, new content on the decentralized web. Another thing that's been really exciting is the 1 million uh, grant program um, announcement for Filecoin Green. This is focused on, um, uh, uh, you know, any sort of uh, software project, instrumentation project, um, uh, experiments um, towards making blockchains verifiably sustainable. Um, and then a, a huge announcement is um, the Brave wallet now has native Filecoin support. And Brave um, is kind of the uh, leading edge of Web3 native browsers. And you can now do all sorts of uh, great things with your Brave wallet, um, including uh, creating and manage Filecoin wallets, importing from Ledger, send and receive file tokens directly from Brave. So really exciting. Um, we have some more things coming up soon. Uh, funding the commons at the end of this week, um, the outlier and tachyon accelerator demo days, the links to sign up to, up to those are there. Um, you can meet some of the um, really, you know, kind of most exciting and um, high potential startups building companies and businesses on top of our technology. Um, most of these are remote demo days, so it's easy to dial in or have it playing in the background. Um, and then our Orbit Ambassador program is hosting a number of events all around, all around the globe. Lastly, but not least, we're um, building relationships and, and lining up a bunch of uh, infrastructure and hosted node providers for Filecoin and FEM. Um, if you have any needs or requirements or suggestions for what those uh, hosted node, node providers should do, please talk to me or better yet, Eva, so we can build those into the contracts and negotiations. Thanks. So much cool stuff happening around the ecosystem. Thank you for the update. Cool, and we are ahead of schedule. We're going to go into our two deep dives, five minutes each, starting with Raul on EVM FBM. Hey, everybody. This is Raul from the FEM team. So it turns out that the FEM team doesn't really rest a lot, and we've been hard at work shipping M1, uh, which, as Jennifer said, is going to be going live with a SCUR upgrade on July the 6th. Uh, and just as a reminder, M1 installs the FEM technology on the network and basically transplants uh, all of chain execution into this new WASM-based runtime. Uh, but also in the last weeks, uh, we've started working towards M2, which is the milestone that most people really care about because it brings the much desired feature, which is user programmability. Uh, and that is basically the ability to deploy custom contracts and actors to the network. Now, um, the first kind of workloads we'll be able to deploy to the network are EVM smart contracts. And these contracts will have the ability to interact with built-in actors. Um, and just as a reminder of how this kind of works uh, under the hood, uh, the FEM is a hypervisor inspired um, runtime uh, environment built on WASM, and it's capable of hosting contracts and programs uh, written on four different runtimes and diverse runtimes. Uh, and, provide, and the goal is to provide seamless interoperability between uh, those, those kinds of workloads. Uh, so uh, bridging kind of like translating calls and making sure that addressing and identity is well covered, cryptography and so on. Why, uh, before uh, we move forward, I wanted to just touch on one topic, which is why are we focusing on EBM programmability uh, first before native programmability? 
Um, and this basically is around the sentiment that we've collected in conferences. Uh, it indicates that the community is really eager uh, to build as soon as possible. And really, they want us to meet them where they are today. Uh, and that basically means that many of these developers are uh, Solidity and Ethereum developers, and they want to use their existing tools and know how to just build on Falcon and get started quickly. Um, they're also uh, very important. They stress to us that uh, the reason that they're deploying Falcon is actually to be able to use uh, the native Falcon features. So one thing that we're focusing on is on providing uh, Solidity libraries, pre-compiles, and so on, so that um, EBM smart contracts will be able to interact with uh, built-in built -in actors and utilize and query and so on, um, Filecoin, Filecoin features and state. Now, they also want to be able to, another advantage of focusing on this is that there's a ton, a ton of ton and a massive number of contracts uh, that have been battle tested, audited, that are production grade in the Ethereum ecosystem that will be able to basically port to Filecoin uh, in a very seamless manner. Um, and these, and also like the important thing here is that these contracts will be able to compose uh, Filecoin features. And these are things like uh, ERC20 tokens, NFTs, and so on, which are useful primitives that then you'd want to be able to compose uh, in, in Filecoin, uh, Filecoin related features, like say, for example, providing uh, provability of NFTs uh, stored uh, in or tracked by a particular NFT registry and providing provability that the data that is uh, represented by those NFTs is alive, healthy, being proven, has a specific replication factor, and so on. Um, so this doesn't mean that we're not going to focus on native programmability. It's, it's, uh, we're going to continue specifying features and specifying kind of like the design surface for native programmability so that we have a full picture. Uh, but we'll focus on bringing those uh, native specific features uh, to fruition later after we bring EVM uh, about. So one thing that I wanted to stress is that um, this milestone is going to be spec first. Uh, and now we have with M1, we shipped a solid set of baseline specs. Uh, that we're able to work against. And this is FIP 30, 31, and 32. So if you want to go check those out, uh, feel free to go into the FIPS repo. Um, but kind of like the spec that kicked off all of the EVM FEM work uh, is this initial parent spec that you'll find a link in, in this slide set, but it's just in the FEM specs uh, repo. We've also enumerated all of the technical areas that are going to require further specs. So we, so the team is currently in a phase where we're doing a prototype and at the same time, we're burning through these specs uh, that uh, will help us continue refining more and more detail. So things like account abstraction for uh, concretely, uh, this will bring us the ability to execute native trans native and uh, transactions that were issued from uh, Ethereum wallets like MetaMask and so on, uh, logs and event support, uh, things like how do we support the EVM delegate uh, call um, uh, opcode and a bunch of other things. So stay tuned if you want, like I would advise if you're interested in this work, uh, subscribe to FVM specs and also subscribe to the FIPS repo and watch the discussions and the, and the issues fly by. Now, this is um, this is a complex endeavor. So you're probably thinking, wow, this, this sounds massive. Uh, yes, and we're aware of it. And we're also aware of the fact that there are many unknowns that we're probably just not seeing yet. So in order to uncover these unknown unknowns, uh, we embarked on an FEM, EVM FEM prototype. And shout out to Kareem. Uh, he's he's a he's a, a team member at, at the FEM project uh, who led the implementation there. Um, and yeah, we just made it public yesterday. So if you're interested in what's going on there, uh, go to that repo FEM EBM under the Falcon Project uh, organization. And as of today, uh, we're able to deploy EVM bytecode and uh, run a simple coin contract that performs state reads and writes. Um, and so with that, we've got a surprise for you. We've got a small demo, which uh, Stev is going to do live right now. Yeah. So. What we're going to do here is deploy the EVM bridge actor, um, uh, then uh, deploy uh, an EVM actor using the bridge actor, uh, using an EVM message. Uh, so cool thing about this is literally going to take an actual EVM message, submit it to the bridge actor, uh, and then uh, execute the init code. It, this The actual workflow here is going to change a bit, or the flow here is going to change a bit um, on, on mainnet because we're trying to reduce the amount of like uh, um, I guess an EVM specific stuff you have to do. What you'd like to do is to abstract accounts so you can just send effectively an EVM message to the chain and chain will be able to deal with it, but we're not quite there yet. Um, okay, so let me quickly run the test. 
Uh, this will take a few seconds. If it doesn't work, we can always switch to a pre-run version, but it's kind of fun. So right now it's uh, trying to actually deploy the contract. Um, what we can see here uh, is, like, look at the code. Uh, can you guys see the code? It's reasonably viewable. Um, uh, so what it did was it went here, created the tester, uh, and then it deployed it. So it constructed the contract. Um, so that's what happened here. Uh, then it signed the transaction using uh, EVM, using the, uh, the key using the EVM format. Um, uh, then it, it uh, submitted a, a message, or basically it called the, um, uh, the EVM uh, bridge contract uh, with this, this custom message. This message here is a quote unquote legacy EVM message. It has a nonce, gas price, gas amount, et cetera. Um, uh, and it includes the input is the contract itself. Again, this is an EVM message, not a Filecoin message. Um, uh, you can see here that it worked. Uh, but let's actually go down and see what actually happened. Uh, so if we look at the, okay, I had this open, there it is. Uh, so basically what this did was it invoked, uh, this invoked actor method here, um, which went down here. Let's try to find where it actually, okay, there it goes. Uh, so once it goes through some testing stuff, um, it executed the message. No, oh, that's the wrong thing. Fine. Uh, so I think it actually did because I can't draw through the code here. Let me just reopen the file. Um, I think it actually did was it, it eventually called this function here, this create contract function, um, uh, which takes the signed transaction uh, and it constructs. So it uses a bunch of stuff here to actually construct a, a, an FBM actor. Um, uh, and then it actually executes the, the EVM bytecode on chain inside Wasm. So this is all in, happening like this here. Sorry, I forgot to mention this. This here is the bridge actor. Uh, this is actually running as an actor inside Wasm. Um, so actually, let's go back, let's go back to the top. Sorry. Um, uh, so at the top, this is the bridge actor and this is the definition of the bridge actor. Um, uh, we ended up calling into process transaction to actually execute the transaction. Uh, inside the Wasm container, inside the FDM. Uh, that process the transaction, it uh, uh, then- Steph, uh, unfortunately we're at time, we have very little time. Are you able to show a message being sent to this contract? Yeah, well, so if you look down here, All right. it- No, no worries. Uh, yeah, it, it is working. Yeah, I don't think it actually sent this this test specifically. Sorry, I did not write the test. This test does not actually send a message, as far as I understand. It just it's all oh, it sends a message to the bridge actor, which then constructs the EVM actor. It doesn't send a message to the EVM actor itself. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I just wanted to talk about what's next. Uh, we have several lines of work that are opening up where uh, the team is working on, on, on the prototype. There's a bunch of things that we know that we need to go through and continue building out on the prototype. This, uh, the work that we do here is then going to feed into the technical design. So there's a really nice feedback loop there. Uh, we're also working on technical design. Some of the most, most critical ones are uh, account abstraction, the universal stable F4 address class, and so on. So uh, feel free to, uh, to tune into the repos for that. Uh, there's also going to be a set of EVM focused uh, community RFPs that we're going to be opening up. So things like Solidity libraries and pre-compiles uh, for interfacing with built-in actors, uh, automated stat test and deployment of existing Ethereum contracts from like things like Open Zeppelin uh, libraries and so on, uh, and a bunch of other things. And also we're going to be starting, uh, and Ali and Dragon are going to lead much of the charge here, uh, a new early builders cohort. Uh, that is focused on uh, on use case building. The previous cohort uh, or the existing cohort, the one that's running now, is focused on tooling, and this one is going to be focused on use use case building uh, using Ethereum tooling, existing Ethereum tooling, and deploying on the on on the Filecoin network. So that's all from the FEM team today. Thanks a lot. Awesome. And if you're a potential early builder, look out for signups. Um, we would love to have you as part of this program. Make awesome new things on top of FEM. And now handing over to Marcus for Chain Snapshots. Okay, so um, this is about the Filecoin Lightweight Chain Snapshots. The project abstract is produced lightweight snapshots, which are required by new Filecoin nodes to join Filecoin networks in less than, than 24 hours. It would take weeks or months to sync a new node from Genesis on mainnet without snapshots. 
uh, snapshot service is a critical part of the Filecoin ecosystem. So, that, so this NetOps project aims to uh, to provide guarantees by operating a HA fault tolerant service, implement monitoring, and commit to uh, service levels. The snapshot service should be capable of producing snapshots from DevNets and testnets as well to support rapid node bootstrapping and test, and test environments. And this project is led by Travis Person. Um, Reba has been running a snapshot service since the start of mainnet. Um, and the outputs of our first milestone will be in line with, with that service, uh, which we will produce a latest snapshot and time stamped car files stored in S3. And the NetOps service will will take over for, for Reba. Um, our goals are to guarantee snapshots are never older than four hours. The mean time to sync a Lotus node from snapshot should be less than two hours. Uh, there should be redundancy in the snapshot service and storage and dis distribution of snapshots. Um, and we will be re reproducing snapshots as they are currently produced. Um, and we will make sure there is monitoring and, and alerts for the snapshots with, with runbooks. Um, a quick overview of how we're doing it. Uh, Travis wrote the Filecoin chain ar archiver service, which has a node locker service and a exporter. We're, we're leveraging the, the Kubernetes cron jobs and using open source Helm charts that we've uh, authored and just using Lotus. Um, a, a quick overview is just that we're able to run concurrent snapshots and, and, and guarantee that each Lotus node is only running one snapshot at a time to, to avoid complications. Our progress so far, uh, the, the, the uh, work is done and we are now actually producing uh, snapshots on calibration and mainnet. If you're going to check out those uh, snapshots and test them, there are some links here. Um, and to, uh, to get to our, our M1 soft launch goal, uh, we need to complete the, the validation, the learning, and, and run books. Um, the M1 soft launch is scheduled for July 20th. Um, at that point, uh, it, it will be it, it will be for for experimental use and testing, and Reba service would continue to run. Uh, M2 would be our our production launch, uh, which would be the end of Q3 2022, and uh, we'll work on on increasing our confidence in those snapshots uh, and their their uh, correctness by having continuous validation running and improving alerting documentation and runbooks. Um, and at that point, we hope that, that Rebus service could uh, begin to uh, sunset and we'll need to coordinate with the Filecoin dev team and then and as well make sure we do a lot of comms and coordination with the broader network is the snapshot links are probably baked into a number of, of, uh, of toolings out there. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm moving the, the best for, for the end here. You're uh, probably wondering, well, you're storing snapshots in, in S3. Uh, we should be storing it in our TL Web3 stack, which we are definitely thinking about. And I wanted to highlight some of the uh, challenges around this. Um, so the snapshots are a little under 80 gigabytes in size and are produced every two hours. So that's one terabyte of data a day. And we also expect the size to, to increase. So we're talking about a fairly large scale storage system to, to uh, support this. Um, and then snapshots become less useful uh, with time. So um, one, one feature we would like to see here is a, a, a retention period to keep our uh, storage scale down and also to keep the cost down. And I think the, the most important part is we have some fairly um, some tight goals and, and service levels about being able to uh, to ensure that uh, Lotus nodes are able to bootstrap as quickly as possible. So we need to make sure that any any solution that we actually um, land on is able to support the, the, download, the download throughput that will uh, satisfy our goals. So this actually makes the uh, snapshot service a fairly good uh, kind of a case study. Um, and we are going to be checking if uh, Kubo and Cluster would would be able to to satisfy those goals with benchmarking. And there's a whole list of cool uh, tools that have come out and services that we also plan to uh, test out. And we would love your uh, your feedback and and um, input on this problem. And um, you can join us on Phil Infra and Phil Slack, and we would love to hear some some of your um, 
some of your your proposals of how we could uh, how we could serve snapshots with our PL Web3 stack. Uh, that's the end. Thank you. Awesome. And that brings us to the end of our all hands for today. Thank you all so much, um, especially for going a little over time. And have a wonderful rest of your day.